And there's several of the small areas around there where they're seeing this trend where you're having a major increase in uh, time on market, but the inventory is still remaining really low. So basically that's suggesting that there's no one buying, but there's also no one selling. And so like, what exactly is that going to lead to? And he's like, that's the kind of the, the key question, right? Because that's never really happened before. What's going on, guys? Welcome to today's episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is actually episode 150. Dan, can you believe that? We've been wow. doing this for a little while. Um, if this is your first time here, my name is Mike DeHaan, and I'm here with my co-host, Dan Austin. And this is Wednesday, the Mike and Dan Show, where we talk about real estate, investing, business, and whatever else we feel like for the week. Um, but uh, it's funny, man. Episode 150, it's funny thinking back. Like mm. We've been doing this for about two full years, and we did one episode a week for, I think, just the entire first year. Yeah, and then we started doing... Yeah, then we started doing two a week and then we started doing three a week. And uh, that's a great way to just like pad those numbers really quick on, uh, on episodes. Well, we probably have like 200 <laughs> if we include the Friday episodes then, huh? Oh, actually, you're right. So yeah, because yeah. we, we have our Friday focus episodes, um, which- Those uh, are numbered differently. Those are, yeah, because we, we started them because we weren't sure if we were going to do them for like ever. Yeah. So we number them differently. And so there's like, we have 60 something of those. So really this is episode like 215. Ooh. Dang, and we're still around despite not having any listeners out there. I know. I don't even know why we still make these. Why do we have a team that puts together YouTube videos that nobody watches? I don't, I don't know. know. Apparently, it's good for SEO. That's what some freaking dork in the social media sphere told me. But uh, I, I haven't seen any benefit to that yet. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I will let, say let like know. The, our, our YouTube stuff, actually, it's really interesting because compared to like the podcast, our episodes, um, the listen – rate i would say is very dependent on like the title that we put and like the subject matter right so like anything anytime we have something that's like about like cash flow or you know like financial freedom things like that those get the most listeners which makes sense because there's a bunch of you fuckers out there still trying to figure that out it's a broader um, audience right it's, it's a broader audience for sure mm -hmm. but when it comes to youtube it's almost entirely dependent on the guest so if we have like a bigger guest their youtube videos will crush mm -hmm. regardless of what the topic is yeah. Um, but like that isn't necessarily the same with the audio show, which I think is really interesting. I don't know why. It's because the audio show, those are our real fans. They're, they're, they're here regardless of what we look like. They're <laughs> here to listen to our voices, take in the information, right? They're on the go. They're hustling. They're moving. They're shaking. Yeah. We should, uh, we have, we have a, like several female guests coming up. We should start to see if our YouTube views yeah. are like significantly higher on those ones versus the, uh, the ones that are just, you know, three white dudes talking yeah. about having money. Right. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure that, 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 uh, that will hold true that I think that probably. theory holds water. If I just look at Instagram and I search how easy it is to find an Instagram following based on how you look oh, male and female. I mean, pretty privileged, man. It's a real thing. Yeah. Uh, the, like people that are attractive and benefit from that, they will argue with you till the end of the earth that that is not why it's they're, they're, they exploded. It's their content. Yeah. Like, they, uh, my fitness that my fitness page is what's well, really at, where it's no, at. no. I like well that that obviously right because that's a vanity sort of thing. But right, like, even yeah. in the even in the business space, the people that explode really fast, you're like, yeah, they're a good looking person. Like that obviously yeah. helps. They yeah. get a broader audience. You could have something unique about your your appearance for sure. To well, that yeah, that's why like Ryan Pineda always has his colorful hair, but he's a good looking dude anyway. But yeah, um, the the fu the funny thing is is I feel like there's kind of this arc with it when people start out, you know, and they are have they're fortunate enough to be an attractive person right i don't know what that's like that's not that's not you and me but i don't know you, whoa, you, you always, whoa, yeah that that's not, not me throw let me say. that around there let's let me say that's careful. not that that's not me but they will they will start to get a lot like a rise to fame from that and they will argue that that is not why they're huge and then all of a sudden you start to see these people that are like really big and they lean into that even more so all of a sudden you have like investor girl brit that's like taking pictures in her swimsuit in front of her self storage unit that she just bought. Right. I'm like, come on. <laughs> like, right. You're going yeah. the other yeah. way, a little bit backwards. They're just but, testing. Just test, retest. Just see, what, just see what the audience likes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, just like that at episode 150, we just polarized half our audience and lost Hell half Hell yeah. Them, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I spent, I spent the last week at um, a in-person meetup in Austin with Aaron and Muchastegui 
who is from episode 135, if you guys got mm-hmm. that one. If you didn't, you should definitely go and listen to that because he is an extremely high-level operator Very in, the, in the residential real estate space and like a true entrepreneur. You know, he has like a major foreclosure business that he runs. Um, he owns over like a thousand residential units. He has a software company. He has a bunch of different stuff that he does. He has his total staff count across everything's like over a hundred people. Um, and this is all, you know, from somebody that kind of honestly just like figured it out. Like he's gone bankrupt three times, two, three times, two times, several at times, least twi- at least twice, at I least twice. Yeah. And his on his rise up and he had this like inner circle meetup. And it's, it's always so, I was like valuable getting around, like going to stuff like that, especially because he kept it pretty small and he kind of like mm-hmm. hand selected people that would go that came to the yep. event. Right. And like some of the dudes that are there, you meet them. I'm just like, what are like, what are we doing wrong? I mean, we had this flipper from Chicago that was there. Um, I know we chatted with him this morning as well, Dan, but this guy is doing 25 million a year with his flipping business. Mm-hmm. You know, he, like at any given time, he has 30 to 40 construction projects and he has a crew of over a hundred people, you know, like that's insane. And we're, we're all over here people. trying to, trying to figure out how to manage. Like if you have two projects at a time, you're like, damn, this is freaking hard. Right. But maybe that goes back to like the 10 Xing is easier. Than I do believe that. Small. Right. Like I think keeping get like, it's like owning one rental property. It's like the worst mm-hmm. position to be in owning yeah. 10 much easier. Right. And so yeah. it's, you're right. It's just more, but you got to be able to get to that level without going bankrupt. That's the challenge. It's like, how do you get from zero to hundred? Cause everybody obviously can understand that, but it's like the hard work it takes to get there. It's like, man, it's murky waters. It's not easy. You know, that's, that's so true. And that's something that I've actually been thinking about a lot as I've sort of tried to surround myself with some of these higher level operators and higher level entrepreneurs. You know, we've had some on the show, like going to their meetups, like doing all these different things. A lot of them talk about like their org charts and like the key players and stuff that they bring in and all these things. And the one thing that never comes up is the fact that because they're already freaking rich, like they, <laughs> they, like they have like, you know, $10 million in the bank, they can fucking bring on the $200,000 a year person. Right. It's just <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> like, like, or, you know, they can, they can like, you know, build a department that isn't going to be profitable for six months. Because they just have the cash to do that, and they have the money coming in already that they can cover those costs. Yeah, they can absorb the risk, right? Yeah, and, and something where you know we can't do that because we're not big mm-hmm. enough on some of these things. It For sucks. Sure. It's like uh, they call it the messy middle in business, but it's like also the messy middle in life, like middle mm-hmm. age, like trying to figure shit out. Some people figure it out faster and sooner than others. Yeah, yeah. For sure, and and there's like a I mean, it's kind of hard to sort of get over that crest, right? And you either can go down like the successful side mm-hmm. or you can go down and completely fail and you really are kind of just like playing that balancing act um and then you know once you get into like the successful realm stuff kind of really has to go sideways for you to fail at that point sure. if you're smart about it absolutely you know? and that and that was like aaron's whole backstory is when he made his first several million dollars he lost it all because he didn't buy any of the properties that he was flipping he was just flipping everything so he had no backstop so when 2008 mm-hmm. hit he lost all of it but now since then he's been buying you know it's like what do you say like every like fifth property or 10th property or something and he's he accumulated keeps. yeah he keeps so he's accumulated this massive portfolio of 800 properties and he showed us like one of his llc's and his cash flow for the year from one of the llc's was like 600k <laughs> A little bit, a little yeah. bit. And it was, like, it was like, you know, 70 properties or whatever was in that. Um, and it's like, well, yeah, you can kind of sustain whatever you want at that point, totally. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it a lot easier, but it's fucking hard to get there. Yeah, for sure. It's super challenging, but very valuable experience. I, I always recommend that if there are people that you want to be around or like people that you want to be like, you know, don't be afraid to pay to go to their meetups, you know, or like Mm -hmm. extend yourself to go and be around them just because just like the passive effect of being around those people is huge. So do you think that Aaron did that to make some money? No, I think, I think he, (laughs) I think he did that to make, put himself around some other operators. Right. Cause he's trying to expand his, um, his business even more. I mean, honestly, like even for us, right. We've, we have our instant investor program. Which people obviously pay to be in that, but we're putting on KeysCon, which is our big in-person event for people that are um, coming out that are that are part of the group to come They're out ready and do some to in-person kick ass stuff. And go to the next level. Yeah, but like you know, people have paid into that to cover the cost, but we're not making any money off of it. Yeah, 
It's literally yeah. a, a net zero because we want to be around the operators that we are helping them grow. And the hope mm -hmm. is that as they grow, they will bring us future opportunity. Right? Yeah, I would and, I bring that up because like that's what I think there's a misconception sometimes when people have events like that, that it's for profit. And I think the only people that are trying to do it for profit are the ones that go and bring in the two hundred thousand dollar speaker and they sell five thousand dollar ticket five five thousand dollar tickets. Like that's for profit, right? Those those are not always uh the best. But no, uh, these small honestly yeah, I was gonna say honestly, the ones that you should be cautious of are the people that have the three hundred dollar ticket, exactly, and and like the huge yeah. thing because they're gonna try and upsell you on their stuff. Yeah, totally, yeah, but and that is for profit. Like, but I've been seeing a few of these pop up lately where there's some awesome players, people that I respect that are doing like the the concept of like the inner circle. Like, they're not even selling a mastermind or a group or they don't have anything. They're just saying, Hey, I want to put this together. Let's bring some a players together. Let's put some money in the pot so we can do some cool shit while we do it. Cause experiences are also what creates memories and also creates friendships and helps network. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and it's funny cause the sort of contrarian to that would be like, okay, so if it's not for profit, why are they charging for it? You want to know the greatest way to weed out people that aren't serious? Ask for money. Ask for money. Exactly. Honestly, you know, and, and so yeah, it was $3,500 to go to this thing and we had to pay for our own hotel and stuff too. So there was, you know, he probably made a little bit on it, but at the same time, he also covered all of our meals. He had multiple staff that were working for us, like the entire Mm -hmm. sort of weekend that we were down there he took us to a the sta a steakhouse in austin um there's probably 40 people there and this is like a hundred dollar steak sort of place right you know paid for the entire dinner everyone's drinks i bet just that bill was six to seven thousand dollars if not more than that for 40 people yeah probably more yeah, honestly at least right depending yeah. on how, how the drinks were flowing right yeah, I mean, yeah. people were throwing them back, right? Thirty dollars scotches at a steakhouse is on the bottom of the list, right? Yeah, yeah. Cheap, you know what I mean? It, yeah, and then you know, then we went out to like a rooftop bar. He covered everything there. Then we went out to a club. He was getting people bottle service. Like he's like putting the money back into it. Yeah, he's reinvesting in his community. Yeah, but that's yeah. but that's the point is, I mean, he, obviously you're saying he's making that kind of money on on just one LLC. Like he's not doing it for money. He's doing it no. to bring a players together and create a network and create a group of people that can go and do business together or sharper steel, sharper steel. So he might get one fresh idea. If he gets one idea out of that whole effort for him, he wins. And then of course, obviously, you know, you got more than one idea from that whole thing. For sure. Right. It makes it mu very mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. but I mean, the connections were great, but also too, just like, he's such a high, like big thinker with the economy. And it was really interesting yeah. to, you know, see his perspective on the way the housing market's going with kind of like mm -hmm. a deep dive on stuff and kind of the main takeaway he was talking about is that there's like these new like sort of like micro collapses that are happening within markets as opposed mm -hmm. to like the market as a whole so we are looking at just like in the austin area where he's based and there's several of the small areas around there where they're seeing this trend where you're having a major increase in uh, time on market but the inventory is still remaining really low so basically that's suggesting that there's no one buying but there's also no one selling Mm. And so like, what exactly is that going to lead to? And he's like, that's the kind of the, the key question, right? Because that's never really happened before. And it's funny because you hear that and you're like, well, yeah, we can kind of like see that. But he like mathematically was looking at that. He's like, these are the trends. Um, but the thing is that was in certain parts of it. But if you look at like Austin core, you're not seeing the same thing. Right. right. And then we, then we look at some other places within Texas and I think Houston as a whole was kind of struggling. Whereas like Dallas is like still 2021. Like houses selling in like, you know, two weeks, you know, what the difference yep. is there. I don't know. Um, well, the fact that Texas is a massive state. So like Dallas could be considered for us like a whole state away, but it's in the same state, right? Yeah. And then whatever industry is booming, I would imagine what, what's going on in Dallas. I don't know. Yeah. But I've heard for the sure. same thing from other resources too, or other sources mm -hmm. that Dallas is a stinking good market right now, which yeah. is funny because last summer it was just an okay market compared, comparatively speaking to the other Texas markets. Mm-hmm. That's such true. a fast, it's fascinating looking at this stuff. And when you have someone like Aaron and you're sitting there going over it, someone who knows how to, how to really look at the data and has the experience. That's the most thing is like, I find with data is like, you can make data say whatever the hell you want it to say, but like, unless you have the experience to know what it means, like it's kind of useless what just staring at it or trying to interpret what other people say. Yeah, for sure. Right. That's why like, you know, like professors and like politicians and things like whatever their opinions are on the data are completely freaking pointless because they've never actually they've <laughs> never they actually done know. the thing exactly they've yeah. never been in business <laughs> yeah. yeah 
Yeah, so they have like an analyst that tells them, but they're still just talking head. For but sure. No, it's super cool. And he's just so well connected too. You know, like so like at our at our dinner, you know, Cody Sanchez. So if you don't know who that is, you've been living under a rock if you're in the yeah. business realm. Right. Um, but uh, you know, he's she's a personal friend of his, and so she just like came and talked at the dinner that we were at and like came and hung out with us for a while. And she's, you know, as sharp as she appears on social media. Do you, you know, want to buy a business now? I mean, I would love to buy a business. I just think that just like everyone else um, that sort of like is in the influencer space, they make things sound significantly easier than it is. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about that is, and this goes for real estate too, is finding the deals. For sure. Right. Absolutely. That's the first step. Like if some, like, for example, if I had a lead source, like I do in real estate, like we have a system built out for a lead source that will let me review deals. Are they all deals I'm going to take down that come into our CRM? No. no. Some of them are wholesale, some of them are flip, some of them are retail, some of them are nothing. Yeah. It, Same thing with business. Like if there's a business pipeline, if there's a way to do that, like I would love to review some, but that is the code I haven't cracked. And I don't know of joining her mastermind would get me there. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just saying, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure there's a way to build the pipeline. The thing that's troublesome with me with that whole trend is just like with um, real estate, you know, several years ago, people start trying to like force these deals mm-hmm. because they're oversimplifying the complexity of it. We, we, you know, we yeah. talked about that a few episodes ago on the Mike and Dan show, but I mean, I'm seeing so many people that are like, oh, I've never managed anybody in my life and I'm going to try and buy this right. business in an industry that I've never even heard of before that employs 40 people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that, that's like, I can't even think of a real estate comparison to that. That's like being like, I've never built anything in my life. I'm going to build a 100 unit apartment complex by myself. Do it. You know, and then, <laughs> and, right. I'm going to go swing my own hammer. And they're like, oh, well, just find like the guy that works there to go and be your manager. It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to go and find the guy that, you know, manages the apartment complex across the street and he's going to come build mine for me. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. no, that's not how no, it works. That's not right? how it works. Absolutely right. So, but anyway, no, it was just super good experience overall. And, uh, if you don't follow his stuff, I definitely recommend that you should, because totally. he, and, he, in my mind is like, it's like his expertise level. Everyone geeks out around Alex Hermosi because he's very charismatic, his level, Aaron's level of knowledge and just like, you know, the way that he views the world and his operator level is the real estate equivalent of that. Like he's totally. very, very solid. Totally. But, so Cool. But anyway, you managed the ship while I was gone, so I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. I guess if that's what you want to call it. We got some, <laughs> shit. We got some shit done. I think we had yeah. some closings last week even. I think we had a decent just you know, run-of-the-mill week where we probably closed on a couple properties, got a couple under. Actually, I think we did three, maybe four contracts last week. Two, yep. we almost had a guy get a hat trick, which would have been like three in like two days, which would have been sick. Mm-hmm. Um, but he didn't, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, we had an overall just kind of like I said, it's – Great week, average week, run of the mill week. I don't know what you would call that. Some people would call it exciting, but um, I think it was just average. It's kind of the worst part about being in business for a while is like stuff isn't that exciting anymore. Sometimes it's average. <laughs> yeah, pretty much you're like disappointed, or yeah. you're like expectations are being met. Right, you're like yeah. motherfucker. Why does this suck? And then you, or you're super pumped, or it's just like okay, now are it's you? average and it's gonna break. Let's break it. When was the last time that we did something in our business that got you super pumped? Oh, good God. I'm, I'm hard to get excited. I'm unexcitable. Yeah. I don't know. It's funny. Maybe. You, you, go for it. No, no, nothing really recently that I can think of. Yeah. On, on our real estate business, um, I can't think of anything in particular. Like, you know, honestly. like we just sold an eight unit and we made a good profit, like yeah. more than most people's annual income. Mm-hmm double the maybe triple the american average income on a on a one year hold yeah you know but that doesn't get me excited that would have got me really excited a couple of years ago uh, maybe 3 years ago but like you know and it, it's not like bragging here it's just like it just when it's a business trading properties is just part of that right you're mm-hmm. not like oh my god big win it's expected i guess at this point that we do that and more often than not it's disappointing if we don't do something that would you know give us a a large capital infusion of the business or have a good average you know profit and loss numbers you know i don't know 
Yeah, on, honestly, what gets me excited on, on the business side most time right now is when we have instant investor people that go off. Yeah, you there know, you go. That's like, a good like, point. Like I always get super fired up with that. Like when we have you know Brennan that made his um, old annual salary in like a week. Like that's pretty yeah. sick. Yeah, that's know? dope. That's the fun oh, yeah. part of our business. It, it is for sure. Which is funny because if you look at it on paper, it's like the lowest revenue part is our, our instant investor program, but it's definitely right. the part that I get most excited <laughs> yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, it's, it pays enough to curate the group and to, to have some opportunity for us to meet these people because they are badasses. Yeah. Well, I mean, it goes back to like people talking about like their why, you know, and like after a while, you kind of learn how to make money. And even though we obviously want to make more money, it's like that isn't what's exciting. What's exciting is making an impact, right? right? And by, you know, having our instant investor program, helping people sort of figure out how to do this business and do it successfully, that's making an impact on other people, which I think is, is very gratifying. What I mean, even today, we were talking to Adam in um, Charlotte, and yeah, that's he, cool. he's, he's been working with us for a while, and he was just mm -hmm. struggling so much. And now to like hear today that he now, he, what do you say, he has four deals set to close over this next quarter. He's going to make mm -hmm. about $20,000 in each one. That's yeah. 80000 bucks in the next quarter he yeah. already has on the books. Yep. Yeah. And he went through the whole process and stuck it out with us where I'd be, I think other people, some others like weaker people would have quit by now, but he stuck it out because he said, well, these guys told me that this is possible and he just kept doing it and he kept doing it and he figured his shit out and he got better. He honed his skills and he just kept following the process. And then sometimes it's like between the individual in this business and also the market with timing and all that. Sometimes there is that, right? There mm -hmm. is that opportunity where you might have to spend like we did several months before we actually made this enterprise profitable. It's not always a quick win. I love, you know, not to beat a, I don't know, beat a dead horse with the Alex Ramosi quotes, but in one of his recent podcasts, he talks about like one of the worst things that can happen, like in cold calling is you get a sale on the first call, because mm -hmm. if your average cold call, you got to call say 5,000 people is the number he used and you got number one on the first call, you got to call 4,999 more people before you could potentially get another one. But what if that next one was the 5,000 call the way? So not only do you have to call 4,999 people, you got to call another 5,000 people on top of that to get deal number two. Mm -hmm. And that's where most people are going to quit and give up in that time. And that like suit that holds so true in this business where you see these months that go up and down, like you can have that where like, Hey man, it's a law of law of averages, the numbers game where you just kind of hit that cycle and, and you're in a funk. And then if you stick it out, you're going to get back on top. But if you quit in that little low spot, you're, you're, you're losing, right? You're giving in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a big reason that so many people that started real estate, like late 2020, early 2021, even if they made some money, they have now failed and lost that money or they've quit because they did not start operating their business in an average market condition. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think yeah. the benefit that you and I have is, you know, I started flipping houses in 2018, you know, you started buying stuff back in 2016 and all through that time we were looking at stuff. So we mm -hmm. had kind of like a bearing about how hard it was to find opportunities. Yeah. Yep. And now, like, even when, you know, we work with different people or we talk to other investors, they're always, like, so picky about deals because, right. like, they still have this image of 2021 and how you could kind of make money with, like, or you could buy, like, all these nice properties where, you know, you and me were like, bro, we used to have to squeeze stuff out of that shit. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that's what yeah. you had to do. Yeah. Shit wasn't doubling in price and you just no. threw it up on the market and made a shit ton of money. Like, it was yeah. a little bit struggle, a more, yeah. lot more struggle. For sure, but no, it's, it's it's been it's been good though. But I always get fired up with that. It's just so fun to see, and I'm excited to keep growing that over the next little while mm -hmm. too. For sure, but, yeah. So I know you wanted to talk about a a hot topic on uh, on your mind since we are approaching the end of the year, and this is something that so many people are looking into. Taxes, baby, our favorite taxes. topic, and that's yeah. why we invest in real estate. I think I don't know. That's what some people invest for. Mm -hmm. I think it is definitely a benefit, but maybe not the only benefit. Um, it's, it, I would say it is one of the main benefits that people with no fucking money focus on for some reason. This is true. Like I, let's just say this public service announcement announcement. If you're poor, pay all the fucking taxes you can, because guess what? Yeah. Then it's your money. It's your money. And when you're rich, you don't got to worry about paying taxes on that money again. So pay your taxes while you can, because it's a lot easier. Worry about the advanced tax strategies when you have to, and it's going to save you money. And the one thing that I want to talk about is depreciation and cost seg, because depreciation is one of the things that saves our bonds at the end of the year when you own properties. And this is where owning assets, you know, depreciation is a big part of the tax benefit of owning those assets, especially if you're flipping properties and you're wholesaling properties and you're doing this full time as a real estate professional. 
because you can then take those tax benefits and use that to write off active income. Otherwise, you are stuck just like writing off your um, cash flow, right, from your rental properties because that's passive income. Depreciation is considered a passive loss. However, like I said, if you're a real estate professional designation, go talk to your CPA about it. You can write off all your other income. And in some years, you can do really good with that because of a lot of acquisitions, a lot of capital improvements or, or whatever types of improvements you're doing in your properties where you can, you can show a loss, but you've actually increased the value of the asset. So for example, say you spent, I don't know, there's some thresholds of what you can spend and what you can expense, all that sort of stuff. But say you improved a property by spending $10,000 on it and the value improved 30 grand. Well, you get to write off 10 grand, but you just made technically 30 grand or 20 grand net in value, right? That's just one way to think about these these taxes. But cost segregation, I've been seeing a lot. Like when I first started learning about real estate, cost segregation was like relegated to like dudes that were buying like 30, 40 unit apartments. Like mm-hmm. nobody like spent the money on a cost seg study because it costs so much. And if you don't know what a cost segregation study is, literally where they go in, like a cost seg engineer goes in and basically counts all the outlets you have, counts the square footage of carpet, the walls, the windows, because all of those pieces, there's actually an IRS tax code. All of those pieces actually have a different life span than what you typically get. Like if you go buy a single family home, it's just 27 and a half years. So you say you, say you paid $200,000 for this house, take out the land is 50 grand. So you got $150,000 in, in approved, land, approved, land, improved land, divide that by 27.5 years. That's how much tax benefits you're going to get each year. So meaning that if that number was say a thousand dollars, you could write off your, your income a thousand dollars at the end of the year, right? So, so you made a hundred thousand and you had a thousand dollars in depreciation. Now your taxable income is 99. It's not like mm-hmm. you get a thousand dollars back. It's just reducing it's your just taxable re- income. For sure. Right. right. Yeah. So the idea of this cost seg engineer or cost seg study is that they're going to go into the building and they're going to break it apart into different segments. So then some of it is depreciated over five years instead of 27.5. So you can accelerate the depreciation. You're not getting extra depreciation. You're accelerating it to an earlier phase. And the idea being is if you're always going to 1031, kind of the mantra of like 1031 until you die, then you're never going to pay taxes on it. Right. Because what happens when you sell a property that you've depreciated, you have to do what's called a capital gain or a, uh, what's it called? Um, depreciation recapture. Mm-hmm. Meaning, basically, if you depreciated a property, say you bought a property again for $200,000 and you depreciated 100000 of it, you have to pay taxes on that $100,000 because you, you were able to depreciate when, it. Yeah, when you sell that property. You're when saying, you, when you sell the property on the exit, exactly. Yeah, so basically, I guess, in, in to put that in the explain like on five version, the IRS lets you not pay those taxes for a little while. Um, it gave you like a benefit. And now that it's set, it's, um, you've sold the property, they say, Hey, you remember how we let you avoid those taxes for the last little bit? Now you got to pay that to us. We basically gave right. you like a little bit of a loan, right? From as far as the tax man's concerned. And now they want their money back with, you know, even additional cost as well. Right. And so the, yeah. So the interesting about this is like Mike and I have been looking at this just loosely. So we have a six unit. We're like, Hey, let's do a cost sex study on it. Cool. Um, good referral from a good friend. Like guy, I, I think the guy's legit, like nothing wrong with him. Right. I, I think he's gonna, he's, a, uh, runs a good company, all that sort of stuff. But as we looked at it and dove into it, like talk to our CPA about it, which I think everybody's going to recommend talk to your CPA about this. He kind of broke it down into different terms for us to like, Hey, Here's something to think about, like not telling us not to do, but here's something to think about. One, the cost seg study side of things, it's like, okay, well, they benchmarked you at like the highest tax bracket. Because of course, from a sales standpoint, that makes total sense, right? You know, benchmark at the highest tax bracket because it's going to show the best cost savings. And what I mean by that is tax avoidance. Mm -hmm. So if you're paying 35% taxes on all of your income, then basically if you were to save $100,000 that you would write that off. So basically you're writing off $100,000 from your cost seg study a year or tax benefits, I should say, um, times that by 35. That's $35,000 in actual tax savings because of your tax bracket. Well, in reality, most real estate investors should not be hitting that 35% tax bracket because you have a lot of different assets and depreciation and tax loopholes that you're able to use anyways before you get Mm -hmm. to that point. Yeah. That's a pretty, you have to have a pretty high income if you're already in a position to start doing depreciation on your assets. Yeah, for sure. So, so I guess basically the end of the, the key point is with this, and this is, I have the um, email from our um, accountant pulled up. As he put it, he's like, if you're not in like the maximum tax bracket, okay, 
you're actually doing yourself a little bit of a disservice for the by like trying to like pursue this accelerated savings um because you are eating a, eating up like the future savings mm-hmm. right and then when they go to do the tax uh the uh recapture when you go to sell the property that's actually taxed at a higher rate than capital gains tax 10 percent higher 10 percent higher so what can ultimately happen as he put it in this case he's like let's say that you go to sell the property in three and a half years basically the amount of money that you would be saving you're going to be giving the vast majority of that back right if you're not going to be 1031 yep. the property and so the point with this whole thing is this is such like a common trend right now with what i would call like small time real estate investors small time being like you're not mate you're not in the highest tax bracket which is very high income what's the highest tax bracket right now is it like 500 600 it's going to be in the, i think you get that 35 percent tax bracket you're probably in the 400s 400 plus I, okay i'll look it up while you talk but, e- but either way like if you are doing regular depreciation in your properties you know you're look at the 75 percent of your rental income all the sort of stuff that people do most real estate investors are not going to have that in like actual bottom line income to the IRS. And so what ultimately what they're doing is they are trying to pursue this tax benefit that actually is going to be a detriment to them in the future mm-hmm. when really like it, you need to be making an extremely large income to be pursuing these this tax depreciation. See the maximum benefit of this, yeah. A- a- otherwise, you're just wasting a bunch of time and money. You're giving up like future yeah. benefit for if you do have a bigger year to like to kind of save not a lot. Um, and I, I think that's the whole point with that. We've kind of went down a weird rabbit hole here, but is like, it's one of those like 1% details that people, in my opinion, sort of waste time pursuing. And I will say, mm-hmm. I feel like there is an industry behind this, that they are heavily trying to sell this to real estate mm-hmm. people because the tax depreciation folks do these studies, they charge a hell of a lot of money yeah. to do it. They're, right. They're not super cheap. So they are heavily incentivized to be like, yes, you need to save all this money on taxes. When really, if you're not like making half a million dollars a year plus bottom line, like after all of your expenses and everything else, you're not really benefiting that much. If you look at like the long term, like you might in the immediate, it might feel good. But if you look at what you've actually done to like your potential for deductions over the next Mm -hmm. number of years, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. To to if you're married filing jointly, the thirty five percent is four sixty two, and okay. the thirty seven percent is six ninety three. So mm-hmm. Those are thousands of what you got to make to be in the top tax brackets. Um, and I think the point being is like if you are in those tax brackets, you should absolutely be looking at any tax benefit you can because you're starting to pay a shit ton in cash, especially if you have a state income tax on top of that. Yeah, so California. If you're at that top tax bracket, you're made, you're paying you're paying fifty percent taxes for sure. So definitely look at that. But to your point, Mike is like. Just because other people in real estate are talking about this and just because other people are doing it on their single family homes and other types of strategies with the cost seg or the, doesn't mean it's right fit for you and you should definitely look at it because it may, because you might be, for me, I always hope I'm going to make more money in the future and my, that mm-hmm. thus my tax bracket's going to go up because A, I'll be making more money and B, I have a strong belief the government will always increase taxes. Yeah. So that being said, that's why I said, if you're not making a lot of money or you're making less money today than you believe you will tomorrow, pay the taxes while you can mm-hmm. so that you don't have to until, and, and think about it in a long-term strategy. Cause like if you're in like a 10 or 15% effective tax rate now, pay capital gains on shit, you know, do whatever now, because when you're in the 25 to 35% tax bracket, that's when paying taxes really starts to hurt. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, I think it just kind of goes back to like, I have this really strong belief that when you're trying to get rich, you should not be listening to, what rich people do and copying them exclusively, right? Like, and this is somewhere where I think people get lost. They think like, oh, because Brandon Turner or, you know, Aaron Mooch Steggy or whatever needs to do this depreciation. That's what I had to do as well. Mm-hmm. When really it's like a 1% issue. It's like, I remember there was this whole thing for a while back when bigger pockets was like topped out and, um, Brandon would be like, I, you know, I need a 15% cash on cash return on my properties for it to be Mm -hmm. worthwhile. And all of a sudden you have all these people who have no money, Hmm. right? And they are going and buying these single family homes for 15% cash on cash return. And it's like, that's a great way to just lock up your capital and never get anywhere. 
when, right. you know, like he can do that because he already has millions of dollars. So he yes. is parking that money and looking to get a 15% return. Yes. When you are trying to turn your $100,000 savings into millions of dollars, you cannot be satisfied for a 15% return, right? Yes. You need to go and, and look for 100% returns, like, you know, 3x, 4x your money. Otherwise, you're never going to get anywhere. And this is kind of like a similar sort of thing. It's like, is it worth giving up all of your future um, tax benefits to try and save, you know, the 40 K and taxes you're going to pay this year, or should you save that so that when you make a million dollars in a couple of years, you can save 300,000. Right. Right. And you know, it's just, it's, it's just interesting to sort of like dive into that. Cause again, it's against the conventional wisdom that I think people are throwing out there right now. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to make decisions based on what's good and right for you. You know, mm -hmm. like I always talk about, like you kind of to add to your point is like, when you're growing your wealth, you need better returns because you don't have as much money. Like that's just the bottom line. And to get better returns, you usually have to hustle and you just have to work harder. And that there's no way of getting around the work hard thing. Like that just has to exist, especially in this business, as you're finding your deals, as you're getting your lead flow, as you're building your portfolio, as you're learning to flip houses, like you just naturally are going to take a bigger risk and you should take bigger risks because the, the distance you have to fall, like uh, the loss of a hundred thousand dollars is a lot less than a loss at $10 million, right? Like <laughs> For sure. yeah. lose it now before you get big. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I, I think just the, the biggest sort of, um, takeaway is like, just because everyone else is doing something doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Nope. You know, so always make sure that you're analyzing your own situation whenever there is something that's very popular be a skeptic of it, like, you know, question it, see if it's actually true or if everyone else is just trying to keep up with the Joneses because yep. there's, that's probably true. Just like For everyone sure. right now who is obsessed with fucking sub two, which is only, you know, 1% of deals out there, but there's everyone that thinks that that's the only way to move forward. And you know what? You should be a little bit skeptical of that at this point because yeah, dude, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but anyways. All right. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up here, Dan? Nope, I'll get off the soapbox. I mean, yeah. sorry, sorry, listeners. Hopefully that yeah. wasn't too. Hopefully that was informative. Hopefully that wasn't the most dry, horrible thing that you've ever. Well, that's heard. taxes, Just right? I, I'm actually literally getting ready to write a check to the for quarterly taxes, so I should I should be able to pitch a little bit. We have to pay quarterly taxes. Um, you should. I I do, but I don't make any money. There you go. I'm a real estate professional. Hmm. So. There you go. Mike has been <laughs> doing cost seg this whole time while we're talking shit about it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm over here emailing my guy back. Yeah. It's like, yeah, cancel that cost seg. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, guys, well, thanks for listening to this show. Uh, we appreciate you all. And if you really want to do us a favor, you should share this with anybody who might find it interesting um, or as you know, is interested in real estate or wealth or whatever. That's just a great way for us to help grow anything. The one thing that I've come to find is that the best referrals are ones, sorry, the uh, best more marketing is referrals. And, you know, we don't really like pay to market this thing anywhere. So if you can refer this to other people, that really helps out a ton. And we really appreciate sure. it. But besides that, if you guys want to ask us any questions or you want to tell Dan that he's a fucking idiot with his accelerated depreciation thought, you should uh, hit him up on Instagram Please. at InvestorManDan. And then if you want to message me and let me know that you think Dan's an idiot, you can do that at Mike underscore invest. And I would also appreciate that. And I will let him know and pass on the Just message. publicly put me on blast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a, it's a questionable topic but anyways guys thanks so much for listening and we'll talk to y'all next week see you